Desideratum is a Latin word, meaning things that are desired as essential. The Desideratum podcast celebrates the art of telling and the journey of listening to stories with narrator Teresa Bakken and her author, artist, and wordsmith, Friends. Episode 18. When the apricots bloom is actually an Arabic saying, and it means something similar to a very fleeting opportunity or something that is very difficult to achieve. When an apricot fruits, you have to get it off the vine straight away or else it it, um, rots. So it's a very, you know, fleeting moment that you have to harvest this um, bounty. And I wanted to use that to sort of reflect the fleeting opportunity that these women have to grasp to solve the challenges that they're facing. This is author Gina Wilkinson, sharing the origin of her book's title. Gina is also an award-winning journalist who's reported from some of the world's most intriguing places for some of the world's most renowned broadcasters. Her book, When the Apricots Bloom, was inspired by Gina's friendships and experiences in Iraq 20 years ago. Our conversation flows easily between Gina's personal experiences and her book's fictional characters. We begin with praise for the audiobook narrator, Rahad Char. You'll hear an excerpt of the book in Rahad's voice in just a few minutes. I was really happy with the narrator we found there. Yeah, yeah she is a um, was born in Syria, but she grew up in Scotland, um, and she's an actress as well. She was she was in one of the Star Wars movies, and she was the lead in quite a successful like independent film last year. So yeah. it's been great to meet her. She was a really beautiful voice. You wrote very visually, I thought. Yes, um, yeah. And I wondered what inspired that. Did you have writers from this part of the world that inspired that? Because it felt poetic uh, in that voice. You know, I think it's more potentially to do with um, my journalism background. I think when you're a journalist, you pay attention to the small details. So I was always conscious of trying to have the small details in there because I always feel like that is what brings the setting and the story to life. So I tried to focus on that. I did try and use all the senses. Like uh, I often um, tried to have a sound or a smell at the in the very first sentence as often as I could. You're right. I really felt the gardens. Like I think you did a really beautiful job evoking oh, great. gardens and But it's more than just describing, like at one point you talk about paint peeling like scales on a fish. And there were just um, literary devices that I thought made it feel poetic. And I was actually thinking she was a nonfiction writer for for your career. So what drew you to fiction? Why why this story in fiction? Well, I guess fiction is a way I think that many novelists get answers that they don't get in their real life. You know, um, there are a lot of answers I didn't get in my real life in in Iraq about my relationship with a woman who was an informant. Uh, There were questions I was too afraid to ask at the time. And I think a lot of novelists are trying to answer those unanswered questions and trying, you know, our real lives are much messier than fiction. And fiction is a way that we can make sense of what goes on around us. And I think that's probably what drew me to it. You know, uh, it was more than 10 years later, I started working on this novel after I left Iraq, almost 15 years. And I was still thinking about that relationship. You know, were we really friends or was it just a job for her? Okay, let me pause and add something here. Gina just said, were we really friends? She's talking about one of her best friends in Iraq, who she later discovered was a secret police informant, was spying on her, reporting her every move. Gina says trying to understand this was a catalyst for writing the novel. 
so I wanted to think about what it would have been like for my friend um, or someone like her the first time that the secret police came to her house. That's the starting point. It's the first time the secret police arrive at the home of an Iraqi secretary and demand that she spy on um, her boss's wife, the friend, her boss's wife, and spy on her. And my own friend, you know, I don't think I was the first person she had to inform on. And so I wondered, you know, what would it have been like originally for her? How would she have felt about it? So that was sort of the the starting point, yes. um, you know, was inspired by that real, real experience. Yes. Yes. It's my love what you just said about it, um, helping you answer questions. Yeah, there's a great quote. Um, I can't remember who actually said it, uh, but it's something like fiction is the lie that reveals the truth. And I think there's actually a lot in that because, you know, there are so many unanswered questions in our everyday life. Uh, people do things out of character that don't always have an easy explanation. But with literature, you can really get into, you know, all sides of a story. You can find out people's deepest thoughts, um, what their motivations are in a way that you can never really get in real life. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that's really beautiful about this is on the surface, a spy is, is a betrayer, is an untrustworthy. And yet the peeling back the why, like, like you just described in this very first scene, we meet the bolt cutter. I think that's just so visceral the way she refers to him that way through the whole book. We meet him, we feel her fear and it, and then her her actions seem understandable, right? You've peeled back uh, the ethics of it in a way that seemed less black and white and more understandable. And I, I feel like you've done that in all three of these very in-depth characters. One of the other things I want people to know about the book is that it is a story of friendship, but this is also kind of a thriller. You know, there's an element of, of danger and that it moves the pace, picks up, and you are, you're anxious to know how things unfold. Like, how would you describe, without totally spoiling what happens, like there is at its heart, these women have a mission, essentially a common goal eventually together. Yeah, you know, I guess that might come from my personal love of, um, I love literary fiction with a dose of um, suspense. You don't need to, to work very hard to um, find suspense, you know, living under a dictator with a war looming and all the choices that these women are faced with, especially in regards to protecting their families. So on that note, protecting their families, we will pause our conversation with Gina. When we pick back up, you will hear what she was surprised to find in Baghdad in real life, that she had to incorporate into the novel. It turns out, it's also connected to one of her essential things. But first, chapter one of When the Apricots Bloom, written by Gina Wilkinson, narrated by Rahad Char. Chapter one, Baghdad, 2002. Huda paced her backyard, trying to brush off her spat with her husband. In the distance, above Aldora refinery, columns of flames pierced the night. An easterly wind pushed the stench of the burning gas away from New Baghdad, so all Huda could smell were the orange and apricot trees by the fence. She knew the wind could turn at any time, but right then the gas flares were beautiful like candles lined up on a giant's birthday cake. The bell rang at the front gate. Huda paused mid-step and wondered, had Abdul Amir forgotten his keys when he stormed off to the coffee shop? Or had her husband cooled down and decided to eat dinner with them after all? Huda hurried inside through the kitchen door. A nougat box lay spread eagled on the counter, cellophane wrapper strewn like evidence of a hasty crime. Huda frowned and swept them into the bin. So much for her diet. The bell sounded again. Something in its flat, insistent tone made her falter. She scurried down the hallway, heels slapping against the tile. In the foyer, 
she paused by a console table decorated with family portraits. The largest of the pewter frames faced the wall. Huda flipped it around. The president stared back at her, eyes dark as tar. Medals marched across his chest. She quickly moved the president's portrait to a prominent position between a photo of her and Abdul Amir on their wedding day and a snap of their son, Khalid, wearing a suit and tie at his 13th birthday party. Next, she set to work unlocking the front door, unlatching chains, turning keys, sliding deadbolts. She ran her hands over her hair and heaved open the door. Two secret police officers strode down the driveway. Huda quivered. Lock the bolts, hide under the bed, she thought. But she knew that wouldn't work. These men were like dogs. Show fear and they bite. Behind them, the padlock from the gate lay in chunks on the concrete. The broken metal caught the glare of the floodlights over the carport. The larger of the two men shoved a pair of bolt cutters into the pocket of his leather jacket. Huda imagined his pockets contained all sorts of instruments for breaking, slicing, and prizing apart. Assalamu alaikum, her voice wobbled. Well, what brings you here tonight, my countrymen? Sister, my apologies for a visit at the dinner hour, called Abu Iza, the older and slighter of the two men. He too was wearing a boxy leather jacket. Men like him were never without them, night or day, even when the sun scorched the blue from the sky and the butchmen on the roads melted into sticky pools. Without waiting for an invitation, Abu Isa and his bolt-cutting partner barreled through the front door. Their bulk filled the foyer and pushed the oxygen out. Huda retreated down the hallway, careful not to turn her back. The men followed. Sand crunched beneath their boots. No amount of sweeping could keep the desert out. The fine grains went where they wanted, just like the officers of the Muhabarat. May I offer you tea? Huda's voice came out high and tight. Yes, please, dear, said Abu Issa. Three sugars. Two only for me, grunted the larger man. I'm watching my weight. Huda waved them into the sitting room and then ducked into the kitchen. In the window above the sink, her reflection stared back at her. Her large, dark eyes were even wider than normal and her plump cheeks were whittled into tight angles. The mouth that Abdul Amir once likened to a rosebud was a bloodless line. No matter how often Huda saw it, she was always surprised by how fear transformed the most familiar face into that of a stranger. She asked herself, why were Abu Issa and his partner here? It had been only two weeks since their last visit. Please, Khalid, she prayed. Forget your curfew. Stay at Bakir's and play computer games. Hoda quickly warmed the tea in the kettle and poured it into three thimble-sized Istakan glasses. The liquid leaped over the hourglass sides and pooled in the delicate saucers. She wiped them clean, balanced the tea, sugar bowl, and spoons on a tray and carried it into the sitting room. Sit, sit! Abu Issa waved her towards a corner chair as if he were the host and she were the visitor. His bolt-cutting partner stared at her, eyes flat as night. Huda's breath bunched in her throat. Let us chat, said Abu Issa, about your work at the Australian embassy. Huda nodded. This was not the first time the Muhabarat had come asking questions about events at the embassy correspondence and meetings, comings and goings, the latest rumours. Everyone who worked with foreigners could expect such visits. Her lacquered nails carved half-moons into her palms. Think of your good salary, she reminded herself. Besides, if it wasn't her job, the secret police would find some other pretense to sit on her couch, to drink her tea, to gauge her fealty. How can I help you, Abu Issa? She figured a rotten tooth was best pulled fast. Is there anything in particular that you would like to know? How is your relationship with Deputy Ambassador Wilson progressing? He sipped his tea daintily, 
Little fingers played in the air. Does he trust you? I do my best to be reliable and professional. But does he trust you? Confide in you. Huda returned the istikan to her lap. Once again, liquid splashed into the saucer and stared at her like a baleful amber eye. He hasn't told me anything unusual. She forced a smile even as her pulse throbbed at her neck. I do routine typing and filing, as you know. I translate his letters when he has matters to convey to our beloved government. And what of his wife? Huda blinked. His wife? How well do you know her? Are you friends? Ali seems nice enough, Huda shrugged. Once in a while, she comes to the office to break her boredom. That's all. Abu Issa raised a tea glass to his lips. He wore a sharp-edged ring with the president's eagle crest. If he slapped her cheek, it would draw blood. No doubt your boss tells his wife all manner of things, said Abu Issa. The foreigners call it pillow talk. Huda stiffened, her istikhan rattled in its saucer. These Western men are reliant on their wives' advice. They call them partners. Abu Usa shook his head. Is it a business or a marriage? The two men snickered, disgust audible amid their amusement. Abruptly, the bolt cutter sat forward and ladled sugar into his tea. The small glass looked ridiculous in his meaty hand. He would need no ring to bloody her cheek. These Western women, they like to talk. The humor drained from Abu Isa's laugh. Every day they go on television and bear their shameful secrets to the cameras for anyone to see. They confess their sins to some Negro woman called Oprah. It should not be a difficult task, then, to win her confidence. The man eyed her intently. Huda stared at the floor. We want you to befriend the diplomat's wife. If the West acts to destabilize our beloved nation, or God forbid strike us again with their unholy missiles, your boss will certainly receive warning. He may let it slip to his wife, and surely he would make plans to send her out of the country. I, I don't think stay close to the diplomat's wife. Abu Usa sat forward. Watch and listen. She may give us early warning, like a dog that howls before the sharky blows in from the desert. The front door rattled. The knob thumped against a firewall. Khaled's sneakers squelched over the tiles in the hallway. Mom? Dad? Huda's heart constricted. She put on her tea and dashed out to the hall. Khaled lopped towards her clutching a fragment of the padlock in his fist. Somebody cut the... I am busy with guests, my son. She blocked his path. Go to your room and wait for me. But the lock! He peered past her shoulder. Who's that? Where's dad? Huda grabbed both of Khaled's shoulders. She wanted to hug him tight, to crush him to her chest and never let go. Instead, she steered him towards his room. Do your homework. Now! Ouch! Khala twisted out of her grip. Your nails hurt! She fixed him with her most evil eye. It was a type of glare usually reserved for his most heinous crimes. Like the time he cursed in front of his grandmother, or when he and Bakr climbed the orange tree and bared their backsides at the teenage girls next door. Go! She hissed. Khala shot a final glance past her shoulder, then slouched towards his bedroom. Huda crept back to the sitting room. The Muhabarat had finished their tea. We will leave you now, sister. It is late, and no doubt you want to take care of your son. Abu Issa rose to his feet. He is your most precious possession, is he not? It was almost midnight when Huda gave up waiting for Abdul Amir to come home and crawled into bed. Above her head, the blades of the fan pushed warm air around the bedroom. She lay on her back and catalogued the noise of the night. The buzz of the fluorescent light in the foyer, the gritty wind scraping at the windows, the click-clack of nocturnal insects. She kept her breathing shallow, 
listening for the dull snap of a lock or the tread of heavy boots on her driveway. In the distance, a car rumbled. Was Abdul Amir returning from the coffee shop at last? Huda sighed like the creaking fan. These days, her husband's black moods were worse than ever. Earlier that evening, when she arrived home from work, he'd been slumped in front of the television, still wearing his baggy pajama pants and singlet. I'm hungry, he grunted, eyes trained on the TV screen. What's for dinner? Huda slipped out of her kitten-heeled pumps. I picked up a roast chicken and rice on the way home. You're not going to cook lamb stew? You used to cook it every Thursday. Huda ignored the whine in his voice. There's not enough time. Stew can't be rushed or the meat will be tough. She glanced towards the kitchen. Is Khaled home yet? He's eating dinner at Bakir's house. Abdul Amir stabbed at the buttons on the remote control. At least my son will get a home-cooked meal. Come on now, be fair. I didn't have time tonight. Tonight, yesterday, last week. You're always busy with your work. What sort of wife puts her family second? And what sort of husband sits in his pajamas all day? Abdul Amir kept his eyes on the television. Huda remembered when she would have happily drowned in his sea-green gaze. She remembered when a kind word was never far from his lips, when he whispered little jokes in her ear. Were those days gone forever? Was that memory, like so many, best forgotten? Huda tried once again to lure her husband from his sour mood. I chose a plump chicken. And I will fetch some cucumbers and tomatoes from the garden. You have a magic way with the plants, my dear. You should not be working for foreigners. Abdul Amir punched the remote again. They don't respect our culture. They don't respect family. Otherwise, they would realize a woman should be home in time to prepare a proper dinner. He turned his head and glared at her. She glared back. Without them, we would have no chicken for dinner. No meat at all. Abdul Amir lurched from the couch and lumbered past her. She followed him down the hall and into the bedroom. He threw a checked shirt over his singlet and scowled at his master's and finance diploma hanging in a frame on the wall. After ten years of sanctions, the economy was almost dead. No one needed an analyst like him to check its pulse. Like Iraq itself, Abdul Amir's pride had taken so many hits. Huda feared it might never recover. He swapped his pajama pants for trousers and stomped back to the living room. These foreigners only want to destroy our country. That's not true. Huda pursed her lips in irritation. Of course, she'd thought twice about working at the embassy. Anyone even remotely connected with foreigners, especially Westerners, drew the suspicion of the Muhabarat. A case of the pox was more welcome than that. But what was she supposed to do? Abdul Amir's company wasn't the only business to close its doors. Huda's previous employer, an agricultural import-export company, had resorted to paying her with sacks of almonds or pistachios from shipments abandoned in their warehouse. Unfortunately, Huda couldn't pay her bills with rancid nuts. Then a cousin, who worked as a driver at the German embassy, called. He'd heard, through the gossipy driver Grapevine, that the Australians down the road needed a secretary with good English and typing speed of 80 words per minute. When he mentioned the salary, Huda's eyes bulged. She'd swallowed her reservations about working with foreigners. Not only would this cover their debts, the salary was more than her and Abdul Amir's former paychecks combined. The staff at the embassy are nice people, she scolded Abdul Amir. They're ordinary people, like us. Everyone knows Australia is nothing but America's obedient lapdog. You can't judge people by the actions of their... Huda broke off as the six o'clock anthem blared from the television. The president rode across the screen in an army jeep. Abdul Amir grabbed the remote and flicked to the next channel. From a gilded balcony, the president saluted a battalion of goose-stepping troops. He growled and tossed the remote back onto the couch. I fear that people will question your loyalty. 
His words were barely audible above the television. But like most sensible people, they had long ago grown accustomed to reading lips, filling in blanks, talking in code. I love my country, whispered Huda. You know that. It is not what I know that matters, he muttered. I'm going to the coffee shop. What about dinner? He had shrugged, grabbed his car keys and stormed off, leaving her to seek comfort in a box of noga, unaware that the Muhabarat were about to descend upon their home. Hoda rolled onto her side and checked the clock on the bedside. She wondered, was Khaled asleep? Or was he huddled under his faded Star Wars sheets, shining his flashlight on a dog-eared copy of Harry Potter? The boy wanted nothing more than to enroll in the Hogwarts Academy. Pity he did not show the same enthusiasm for study in real life. Huda's ears pricked up at the familiar rattle of Abdul Amir's Corolla station wagon turning into their street. She swung her feet over the side of the bed and into a pair of fluffy pink slippers. A Mother's Day gift from Khaled three years ago. They were worn at the heels. In the hallway, she paused and stuck her head into his bedroom. Khaled was curled up like a snail. She continued to the front door, unlocked the deadbolts, and released the chain. Outside, dry leaves whispered in the darkness. Abdul Amir's voice boomed from the far side of the gate. What the hell? Have you locked me out of my own home, woman? The lock was broken. As Huda pried open the gate, she could smell the burnt molasses of Nagala smoke embedded in her husband's hair and clothes. I had to replace it. How on earth did it break? Abdul Amir waved his hands about like an angry prophet scolding his flock. Do I need to punish Khalid again? Please, my dear, be quiet. Huda peeked along the potholed street. Tall walls stretched in both directions, draped in flowering bougainvillea or fragrant jasmine. All were topped with metal spikes or shards of broken glass. I'll explain everything in the backyard. Abdul Amir stiffened. The backyard? he whispered. His hands were still raised, but now he looked less a righteous prophet and more like the victim of a stick-up. That would be best, Huda murmured nervously. Like his wife before him, Abdul Amir scanned the street. The wind groaned, the grains of pale desert sand scratched against her cheeks. A razor-thin moon hovered high over Huda's backyard. The flames of Aldora still spiked the horizon, but the wind had begun to turn. Huda's nose wrinkled at the smell of burning gas. Abdul Amir stood on his toes and peered over the neighbor's fence. No lamp glowed in their window. Their own house was dark and quiet too. Still, it was safer not to talk indoors. Walls have ears, and so do teenage sons. Abdul Amir and Huda huddled close. What did you tell them? he whispered. There was nothing to tell, said Huda. I barely know the woman. If she stops by the office, we chat about the weather. Small talk, that's all. I mean, why would I go asking for trouble? Huda scanned the dim reaches of the garden, the orange and lemon trees, the vegetable patch in the corner, the wrought iron swing seat that rocked back and forth on squeaky hinges. Abdul Amir raked his hands through his hair. In the moonlight, his fingers were pale as bone. What do you know about this woman? Ali seems nice enough, mumbled Huda. But it can't be long before she packs up and returns home. The heat and the sun always prove too much for the embassy wives. And the loneliness too, thought Huda. She remembered meeting Ali a month ago, at the end of her ten-hour drive from Jordan to Baghdad. The young woman had stumbled from the embassy land cruiser, hand raised to ward off the sun, legs wobbling like a sailor stepping ashore after months at sea. All the way here, I kept looking for white sand dunes and camel trains, Ali laughed awkwardly. No one had the heart to tell her that was some other country. Huda remembered when women like Ali had flocked to Baghdad. British nurses, French school teachers, and the plump wives of American oilmen. Tourists filled the cafes and strolled the banks of the Tigris. But nowadays, the expats were gone. So were the tour buses. 
the rail line to Istanbul was severed, and NATO jets shot down any planes that entered Iraqi airspace. These days, only a handful of diplomats and United Nations workers ventured to the wide western desert to Baghdad. Very rarely did their wives join them. And like the exotic parrots at the Al-Ghazal pet market, the women soon went off their food, drooped and plucked out their own feathers. Then they disappeared back into the desert, pale-skinned gypsies in four-wheel drive caravans, leaving nothing behind but a trail of dust and perhaps a forgotten sun hat. Eventually their husbands were posted elsewhere, and life resumed happily. At least Huda assumed it was happily. It was almost impossible to stay in touch with those outside Iraq's borders. Unwise even to embark on such friendships in the first place. What is she like, this Ali? Abdul Amir paced back and forth. Is she one of those arrogant foreigners who know nothing of history and believe we're all savages? Uda shook her head. I don't think so. Will it be difficult to befriend her? The moon slid behind a cloud. Uta was glad of the darkness. I don't know, she lied. Ali wasn't standoffish at all, and Huda sensed it would be easy to draw her close. Until this evening, Huda had thought she could handle the obligatory visits from the Muhabarat. She kept her answers brief, but true, and made it a rule to avoid gossip. She was only a secretary. She had nothing to hide. Besides, her Australian bosses weren't fools. They told the Iraqi staff only what they were happy for the government also to know. The rest they kept to themselves. Huda remembered depositing her first embassy paycheck and how the bank clerk's eyes widened as he eyed her salary. His usual sneer disappeared. He called her Madame for the first time and asked if she'd like tea while he processed the check. She'd relished that moment far more than she cared to admit. Now the strings attached to her job drew tight around her neck. Abdul Amir stopped pacing back and forth across the lawn. Did Abu Usa offer you money? He said. Money? Uda frowned. Of course not. No one gets rewarded for answering their questions. Let's be honest. They want more than that. Much more. He ripped a prickly sow thistle from the lawn. I heard sometimes they pay informants. Uda tasted the sour gas from the refineries on her tongue. I am not an informant. You wanted the embassy job? Abdul Amir snorted. You wanted to work with foreigners. Did you not consider there might be a price to pay? Huda had thought she was so smart that she could type a few letters, take the foreigners' money, and manage a muhabarat too. She'd ignored the voice inside her whispering, you're playing with fire. She searched her husband's face. His eyes were nothing but shadows. Have I not paid enough already? She asked. I really liked learning. And so how important was that to you to educate behind the headlines of the women and their experiences in this, in this really critical time frame in Baghdad? Yeah, that was um, very important for me because many people's uh, images of Iraq or thoughts about Iraq are shaped by what they saw on their TV screens during the Iraq war. And of course, it's a much more complex society uh, uh, than what you can possibly fit on in, in a newspaper headline or in a three minute report on the television. And so I wanted to show uh, you know, the, the stresses of living in Baghdad under Saddam Hussein, that feeling of always being under surveillance, yes. um, the oppression. But I also wanted to show some of the positive sides of life. And that's why uh, another of the main characters, uh, there's three main characters, as you mentioned, um, one of them is an Iraqi artist. Because when I arrived in Iraq, I had very little idea of what I was heading into. It had been cut off from the world by international sanctions for more than 10 years. You couldn't fly in. The international community was very, very small. And when I arrived, I was so excited to find out that there were more than two dozen independent art galleries operating in Baghdad at that time. And that was a real lifeline for me. You know, in Iraq, artists are very respected. Uh, it's a very honourable 
profession. And they've always played this role of connectors between the outside world and the inside world. You know, this is dating back millennia. So I wanted to show, you know, that other side of life in Iraq, you know, the beautiful aspects of Iraqi society because it has such amazing history and culture. And I also wanted to do it from a female perspective because so often we hear from Iraq, you know, literature from Iraq is written from a male point of view, often a, a combatant's point of view, a soldier's point of view. And I, I very deliberately tried to keep it um, to sort of a domestic lens or a female centric lens. And I was very lucky that um, I had three close Iraqi friends um, proofread the manuscript for me. You know, that was a great help. And I got to say, my Iraqi friends were a great help in another way. And they had been through so much, you know, and they didn't allow it to make them bitter or cynical. They kept going. And I found that really inspiring. And I tried to inject that into the characters. You know, we had some very tough times in Iraq, especially, uh, you know, after the war started, we lost some very dear friends. And I remember one day uh, I was quite upset. I was crying, actually. We had, you know, buried a friend recently. And I remember my Iraqi friends coming to me and saying, you know, Gina, don't let this stop you. Don't let this overcome you. You know, keep going. Keep going. Don't give up and don't let it make you into a different person you know don't let it harm the important parts of you you know uh, one of the surprising things uh, many people take away from my book is the level of equality that women had um, women in Iraq had uh, greater freedoms legally than almost any other uh, you know, any other countries in the Middle East at that time. They had very high-ranking positions uh, in government. My friends were engineers, doctors, lawyers. You know, in the book, I show how it's beginning to erode. As the war draw draws closer, Saddam Hussein starts making deals with more conservative, hardline religious um, politicians in order to shore up his own power. And he's then prepared to trade off, you know, some of those rights that women had enjoyed. But definitely, you know, that moment in time, that particular society that I tried to show in that way of life, you know, that is, is history. Right. So I like to ask for you, what do you think um, are the things that you desire as essential? Mm, okay. Well, you know, definitely family. Uh, what do I desire? Well, I do love a good book. That's true. That's, a, that's always a source of comfort. But, you know, I feel like if my house was burning down and I had to grab a few things apart from my kids and my cat, I might grab some of my art. Um, I have a few paintings actually that I picked up in um, Iraq at, at various art galleries there that representative, I guess, of that time and place for me and in that way uh irreplaceable uh and also I guess um chocolate <laughs> chocolate yes it's important to know what your fuel is what feeds you is essential mm -hmm. that is true no I love the answer art because I do think we are we are fueled by that that is something that and, and it and it evokes something in our past usually it's connected to memory just so powerful. So I love that answer, actually. So I would usually end there. But then Gina shared this about her roots, her nomadic years, and how that formed the heart of her book. You know, I grew up in a very, very small town in um, remote Western Australia. It was 1,500 people, no traffic lights. And then I went on to live, you know, 20 years overseas, you know, many parts of the world, huge cities. Um, and every place I went, I found people with great stories, people that I could relate to. And, of course, every culture has its unique aspects, um, but the most important things I think we actually do share, you know, um, 
yes. the need for safety, uh, the importance of family and uh, the desire for freedom and friendship. So while we might uh, bake our bread in different ways, we might pray in different ways, at the heart of things, my experience has been that we actually have you know, the most important things we do share. And I wanted to show that through this book. You can find Gina Wilkinson's When the Apricots Bloom in all its formats, including the audiobook, linked in the show notes. And of course, on the Desideratum website. A special thanks to Vida at Kensington Press for connecting me to Gina. And thank you for listening.